In today's episode, we are going to be discussing what will move the gold price higher, what is happening in our global financial system. And we're joined today by Lior Gantz. And Lior is actually at the moment in Tel Aviv while some of the missiles and bombs are going off. He actually even has some recordings of it. And so first we'll, uh, we'll just send our prayers out to everyone out there and, um, We'll uh, have you in, Lior. So how are you doing out there in Tel Aviv? Um, I, there's no bombs, actually. It is it is missiles. Um, but yeah, it, it's interesting. 20 years ago, uh, this person that is a rocket scientist and, and uh, whatnot, he was pitching the government, the Israel government, that is, on how to intercept uh, missiles and rockets, and he was having trouble raising two million dollars, which is wow. for the uh, defense ministry for his idea called the Iron Dome. Um, but if you Google or free search the Iron Dome system and how does it work, um, it basically is what's protecting uh, the skies. It intercepts the missiles and uh, it midair, um, and so about ninety percent. Uh, we were fine. They fired from the Gaza Strip. There has been over, I think, 3,000 to 3,500 rockets have been fired in the past week. Some from Wednesday to this Wednesday that we're recording. I don't know when this airs, but um, about 90 to 95 percent have been intercepted midair. Um, and what's uh, interesting about the Iron Dome is it only intercepts those that it that it projects will, will go to a populated area. So it, it, it doesn't even send a rocket if it goes to an open area to save you know money. And, and uh, obviously there's a capacity for how much you can go out. So it's been interesting. Obviously as a father, it's kind of different than the last time in 2016 when, um, when I, I was not a father, different you know things going through my mind, et cetera. But very interesting times. It came out of nowhere this time, really out of the blue. Um, and I'm sure that uh, we can discuss it uh, at length, but usually these political subjects get so um, um, controversial so fast. So, yeah, that I, was an amazing videos of the ones that that you sh- that you sent that where you could see the actual interception of the missiles in midair, and that was incredible. And so, you know, we send our, our prayers out to you and your family. Now, let's digress over to the last time we spoke it was probably in fall so we had maybe gone six seven months of this kind of lockdowns and trump was still in office biden is in office now um different world yeah different world we're seeing a, a lot of people that um don't have jobs don't want jobs a lot of people not paying rent can't pay rent can't pay mortgage and we're kind of in this interesting position where global governments have essentially said they're going to print as much money as possible. And so I want to start with how do you assess the, the first of all, the global macroeconomic picture and, and I guess quagmire that we seem to find ourselves in post lockdowns? Yeah, I think, you know, if you think about a Formula One race, OK, if, if the car has issues, there's problems with the braking system or tires or it's uh, low on fuel or anything. If there's a, if there's a problem or maybe a, a, a very big mechanical problem, they tell the driver pit, pit, pit. And you go in, you change whatever you can if it's possible, and then you send them out. And that takes about 30 seconds from when you go in, they change whatever they need to change, and you go out. And that's more of like 2008. There was a real problem with the car. And you needed to pit. And when you do that, it takes time to go back. Then you got a new set of tires. It takes time to go back to your rhythm as a a driver. And you saw slow recovery. This time around, the car was going like full throttle. 2018, 2019, early 2020, economy is like booming. And then there's nothing wrong with the car, but there's a big sign that says stop. And so a Formula One can go from zero to 200 in two seconds. It can also break from 200 to zero in two seconds. It's, it's nothing for it to do. It's literally, it's built to do that. So, and that's what we saw. We saw in March and April that 
literally governments telling their economies, stop, stop, shut down. And when the person that says stop, shut down, move aside, the car was perfectly, perfectly fine. In fact, while it was resting up, they turbocharged it. They gave it all sorts of, you know, uh, more things on it. So, man, that thing flew. And that's where we are right now. We're not in a recovery. We're in a boom, a, a, a phenomenal boom. And the problem is when you turbocharge something and you put a nitro on it and you put everything, man, that car can go out of control. And so now the spectators being the investors in this analogy, they're like, man, is this car too fast for the driver? Is this car out of control? And it's looking to see how much laps it can do and, and how does the lap, is the lap time good? Is it bad? Maybe they, they need to, to pit it and they need to like extract some of that power away from it. And so all these questions come up and it's, you, you don't know who's making the decisions. There's all sorts of new decision makers in the, you know, in the constructor team. And being Biden, being Yellen, you know, uh, new people. And so investors are sitting there and they're saying, okay, the car looks amazing, but maybe is it too amazing? And you're seeing all sorts of things happening. So in real life, what this means is that I think there's a real boom um, for many reasons that have nothing to do with what happened last year. And then were exacerbated by the monetary and fiscal response, as you say with people not you know, working and et cetera. There, there have been very um, weird type of uh, events that we're seeing because there was no moral hazard, right? In 2008, you know, the bankers were the enemy. And you were like, what, you're gonna bail out the bankers? That's bad. That, there was like a controversy about bailing out and giving federal aid and taxpayer money. Here, there was no moral hazard. There, oh, look at all these people that are suffering they didn't do anything. And so there was not a lot of backlash from anyone uh, regarding aid. So they, they just showered them and papered them over with government debt and et cetera. But, you know, at the end of the day, this was a healthcare crisis and not a financial crisis. You don't have to go through like millions of homes going through bankruptcy process and all these. It's not that. It was a great economy. And they stopped it and then they let it fly again. So I think that's the big difference between 2008 and today. And the second big difference is they didn't just target corporations. It, was, it wasn't like they just helped the stressed airlines or something. They gave money to 150 million homes and households got, you know, uh, up, I think it's uh, over a trillion dollars uh, collectively in all of these stimulus checks. That's a lot of money for the consumers and households to get. And now they're talking about more and, and, and even perpetual. So I think, Jake, uh, the, where we find ourselves is at a point where there was a big fear that inflation is, is borderline hyperinflation. And we got the CPI numbers a few days ago, and now we know it's not borderline hyperinflation. There, there's an inflationary issue, but it's not out of hand. And so the new question that's now being asked is, okay, well, which part of the economy will be inflationary going forward for the next few years? And will it be a big inflation? And which part is temporary and fleeting, as the Fed says? And then the second question is, what will the Fed do about it? Is it going to start tapering? Is it going to start, you know, um, throttling back? Is it going to raise rates? And at which point will it raise rates? And all these questions is what you're seeing in the markets right now. Because you're seeing, for example, indices at all-time highs, but you see all these uh, retail darlings down like 40, 50, 60, 70% in like two months. And then you see GameStop happening. And after that, you see you know crypto going nuts. A lot of these things that are happening um, because people are trying to figure out what is going on. And I think the big question will be how much inflation will stay with us and and where? Is it in wages? Is it in food? Is it in commodities? Um, because the, that, that's really the, the big question that the Fed is going to be looking at. And that's what, that's what will dictate tech and gold and cryptos and where prices are uh, compared with each other. Now, 
what is your expectation? We've had people that have come on the show and they've said, you know, they think everything's going to crash or they think that the the Fed will raise interest rates than other people that have said it's impossible for them to do that at this point. I mean, it could be total travesty on a, on a global level because they've created such a dependent system on on this free money. Yeah. And so where do you fall on the inflation, deflation moving forward here? You know, of course, we've seen you know, big inflation and also some of that happening due to supply chain shutdowns creates a double whammy, perfect storm. Now, yeah. how do you think it plays itself out? So the system itself, every time there's a crash, the system is deflationary, right? The debt comes down, leverage comes down. That's the, the natural uh, flow of things. We, we inflate, we grow, you know, population grows, lending grows, mortgages, et cetera. We, we build this money supply. And if we allow it to crash, then it's very deflationary. It, you know, if, if uh, the federal government and the Federal Reserve did nothing last year, we would have had a Great Depression type event in, in uh, the United States and elsewhere uh, because you just had a, a very slow contraction of the private sector. And what the government basically does, uh, especially since 2008, it says, look, we'll just go into the debt. We'll, we'll just fund this with uh, money, uh, you know, but from the future, from 30 years in the future, 20 years in the future, and we will save the private sector so it can uh, go forward. We'd rather have that pain than this pain type of, uh, you know, thinking. And I think that um, if you look at the way that the, uh, this structure is built right now, um, there's a big chance that inflation is not going to be a a sustained problem that uh, is 1970s style. In the 1970s, you had a move where you you took uh, the dollar off of gold. That's a big move, uh, a big change in monetary policy, and it caused a big reaction. We don't have that right now. We don't. We, it's not like they changed something really big in the fiat monetary system. They they're adding way more debt and they're creating you know amazing, not amazing, but uh, horrific problems for the future, but they're not um, they're not revolutionary problems. They're debt problems that are accumulating. And so I think this uh, scenario where you go into hyperinflation type Venezuela and Argentina and whatever in the United States is um, unlikely, very unlikely in my opinion. Um, but on the flip side, you know, if you ask me what I did, I took two years worth of my living expenses and I converted that fiat currency into gold. And so I have way more gold than most people do. Um, if you think about 24 months worth of my living expenses, hypothetically, if there's a, if my family unit spends 5,000 a month, that's $120,000. That's way more gold, physical gold, than most people on this planet have. And so, um, you know, with, with the fact that I'm saying it's unlikely, doesn't mean that I don't hedge that uh, and that I don't take precautions. But I do not think that inflation is going to be, you know, eight and ten and twelve percent on on the CPI, which is what people look at. I obviously know the CPI doesn't include food and energy. I, I know the whole thing, um, but that's what investors in Wall Street look at. Um, I do think it will run at two and a half to two point seven to two point eight percent, which is a lot for the U.S. economy. Um, and then you look at interest rates, right? That was your next question. Will they need to to raise interest rates? Well, the United States government pays about 1.6% for the 10-year bond. And then you just do a free search of every government in the world and what they pay for the 10-year. And you tell me, if you think that the United States government, the world's number one economy, uh, the most diverse economy in the world by far, 25% uh, of global GDP, if you think that they should be paying one6 while Bulgaria and um, Greece are paying like uh, 0 0.2. And then you got uh, a whole array of European countries paying negative official rates. Negative official rates, you literally you borrow money, you lend the money and you get less uh, uh, guaranteed. So the United States government is paying already an arbitrage about our other governments. If they go to uh, 1.8 or 2% on the 10 year, I mean, all of the money in the world will flood the United States because these other governments can't compete with that. 
So they'll need to raise rates. And for them, with the worst economy in the United States, uh, that's even uh, a bigger difficulty. So I think we are in a world of low rates. I think we will stay in a low rates world under this system for as long as the dollar is the world's reserve currency and it's like, you know, 59 or 55 or 50 percent of the world's transactions, uh, we will probably have a very low interest rate environment. So I would plan on that for the next three, four, five, six, seven years, unless there's a change in the monetary system itself. So that's what uh, with regards to that, with regards to a crash in the markets. So a once in a generate once in a in a you know a hundred year event took the markets down by 35%. So you have your best case study, Jake. Uh, think about it. You had 35% for the S&P 500 in 16 days. That is with the worst black swan event in 100 years. And so um, you, you think about that, and then you think about how much can stocks crash in a world where uh, stocks are pretty much the only uh, place for big, big money. Um, when you look at sovereign wealth funds and, and pension funds and insurance companies, I mean, these uh, institutions that have to manage hundreds of billions of dollars, they can't buy real estate with all that money. And so they mostly go to bonds and to stocks. And with bonds being, you know, uh, very low on the, the yield they pay, the dividend yield of the S&P 500 looks very attractive, uh, even at high valuations. If you look at a company like Apple, or Amazon, and, and, and you say, oh my God, 35 times B ratio? Well, Apple is a safer company than the United States government. <laughs> it, it is. What would, go, what would go bankrupt first? You know what I mean? So there's a premium to pay for these hybrid bond, hybrid stock type of uh, companies, and they happen to be the world's largest companies in 29, 28% of the S&P 500. So, the long short of it is I think that high interest rates are not coming. Um, very, you know, when when you say high interest rates, I think the 10-year can peak at like three, three and a half percent, and it will take it uh about three, four years to do that. Um, but that's it uh, under this kind of system. I, I we have no idea what will happen tomorrow. Maybe tomorrow China will say, hey, we want to have a Western standardized uh, you know, economy and it was a standardized currency where we'll stop any manipulation. And man, you will see a flood of these Asian countries buying yuans and selling the dollar and, and all hell will break loose. But as we're doing this interview, the United States government has the safest currency out of all of these fiat currencies. Um, and they paid a very high interest rates compared to these other governments. I don't see a reason why they should uh, aggressively raise rates. We have never seen a very um, uh, aged economy like the United States, a very developed economy, go through hyperinflation. We've seen them go through de deflations, but hyperinflations happen either in very weak banana republic type economies, you know, Yugoslavia in, in the wartime, uh, Germany after World War I, et cetera. You look at these countries and there's things that are in common uh, to them. For the United States government, uh, well, for the United States economy, I think a more likely scenario, which I know you you know your uh, some viewers are like, no no give me the doom. I like the doom. I don't think that's what will happen. But look at the last twenty years, and look at what has happened with gold. It went from about two hundred and fifty an ounce to about two thousand an ounce, and it's done better than stocks. It's done better than real estate. Better than REITs. Better than bonds. Done better. And there wasn't. Anything you know crazy with the uh, with inflation? So gold and inflation, people think that they're correlated, but if you if you if you um, um, chart them and put them you know uh, on top of each other, you'll see that there's there's less correlation than you think. Gold is correlated with real interest rates, and real interest rates are the subtraction between bond yields and inflation, and that's what you need to be looking at. Um, because that uh, tells you the whole story of why gold went down from August 2020 at the highs to being the worst performing asset class in Q1 of 2021. Why has that happened? Because real interest rates were going up and up and up. So I think that's important for, for people to understand. We can definitely uh, talk about gold, but 
just so you know, in, in our uh, newsletter in, in wealthresearchgroup.com, that's what we cover all the time. We look at these things, we publish the information, we publish, uh, we created a very nice special report for this uh, show for your listeners if they want to check it out about this whole thing uh, at wealthresearchgroup.com uh, forward slash squeeze and forward slash go playbook uh, that they can check out. So I think that is the key to understand that, that, that inflation doesn't necessarily mean gold is going to the moon. So um, then what do you anticipate from gold moving forward? Well, the, the thing is, I don't anticipate anything for gold. What I do is I look at the asset universe when I wake up in the morning and I say, okay, well, what is attractive relative to other assets? Nothing is attractive on an absolute basis, and certainly not gold, which is you know a non-producing asset. You simply hold it in your hand, and that's what it is. That's what it, it's going to be tomorrow. It's going to be 20 years. This was, it's an ounce of gold. But relative to its um, alternatives, is it um, attractive or not? And when you look at gold today, and you look at real interest rates, you say to yourself, it's preferable to cash and it's probably preferable to bonds. And I think that is good for gold and it will stay relevant. Uh, meaning that I don't think that gold is going to 1500 or 1400 or 1300 or any of these deflationary predictions. Is it going towards 2300 and 2500, et cetera? What needs to happen for that is you need to see two things. One, you need to see inflation staying with us. So. CPI numbers that constantly come in at two and a half, 2.3, 2.5, 2.6, 6, et cetera. And on the, on the other side of this equation, you need to see the Fed saying, hold, we're not gonna raise, we're just gonna hold, let inflation, what, uh, which is what they want, average out these years that we had in the previous decades where inflation was 1.4 and 1.3, right? Because they want to average it at two, 2%, that's their target. So you just had a full decade of 1.3, 1.4, 1.5, which is lower than their target. They would love to see you know, 2.5, 2.5, 2.5 for years and years and years to average it out. And if they do that, if they hold the line, if they don't uh, succumb to the pressure of raising rates too soon, I think that's really good for gold. And I wouldn't be surprised to see gold at $2,500, $2,600 an ounce in a year to two to two years from now, because there's all of the um, current situation implies that gold will continue at about seven to eight percent clip, um, and obviously after it goes into a new all-time high, it attracts so many speculators and traders that it can shoot up really quickly. So I think I am very bullish on gold, but. It's not like I'm bullish on gold over stocks. I'm bullish on gold over um, cash. And I'm certainly at this point bullish on gold versus cryptocurrencies, um, which have done, you know, did an amazing, incredible move, um, which I don't think is going to uh, replicate itself in, in the near future. I think um, we're pretty exhausted on, on this front of cryptocurrencies and altcoins. Now, when you look at the world coming out of of lockdowns and you kind of say okay well I, I understand people say look we're in a boom but the reality is i mean there are so many people that are not paying their rent and their mortgage and yeah sure we're in a boom but it you know when you really look at the nuts and bolts of like your average everyday person in society i mean it's it's kind of an interesting situation to be in and I wonder, do you expect central bank digital currencies to play a role in governments giving people uh, stimulus or money to spend in these types of things that have been kind of discussed? Great question. And I, I think the answer is yes. We live uh, in the United States. You live in a country where the wealth is created by very few people, by very few companies. Um, and then you have a very big, small business community that creates about half of the wealth and they service 
uh, this domestic economy. So the multi corporation, the multinationals, which are uh, you know the Wall Street and the stock market and, and what we call the the paper economy, they create GDP, uh, but it's you know most of their um, uh, real world economy is outside in in like 48 countries that are the cheap labor countries of the world where manufacturing occurs. And so that doesn't help the United States. Uh, it, it's outside of it. And then you have the real economy, which is, you know, doing its thing because it's a service economy. Um, and people are struggling because automation is taking their jobs, robotics, AI, 3D printing, et cetera. You have seen less and less high paying jobs and definitely in very concentrated areas of the country. And then you're like, okay, well, there's 150 people that we employ in this country, but about half of them are at 30K a year, which is nowhere near middle class. What are we going to do with all these people? And, you know, they're, they're in a problematic situation because they give their kids very poor education. Um, and, and, you know, they're motivated. They want to climb up the ladder, but it's not easy anymore to climb up the ladder in the United States. The mobility between the lower quart the lower quartiles and the higher quartiles, it's almost impossible to climb. In fact, Ray Dalio did a, a very good study on this. And he says only 14%, that's one out of seven poor people, lower income people, ever climb up even one quartile. Not from regs to riches, where, like in the old days where America was Atlanta, just one quartile, just move from like uh, abject poor poverty to just over the poverty line. That that is even one in seven. So you have to think there there's a there's a whole class, tens of millions of people that are just perpetually poor. Um, and, and we can debate why and you know are they super lazy or are they you know uh, are they unfairly stuck at this level. Well, my concern is that the government, global governments have created an entire new level of, uh, of people living at or below the poverty line due to the lockdown responses. And it's still a conversation. Very few, very, it makes people upset to even suggest that this is a very serious ramification um, that was caused by governments. And, yeah. and, you know, back in July or August, I believe it was last year, the UN said it was about, they were saying about 200 million people would be pushed into poverty. That was a long time ago. And so yeah. my um, concern more so than stock market crash or inflation is what happens to the social fabric of society when the haves and have nots drastically increase, because, you know, even at government figures of 2.7% inflation, you know, we know that's a, a BS number and it, it, and, and, it, and it affects your, you know, a person so much more. And what happens when your unemployment check or your stimulus um, or your pension or your, you know, um, salary job no longer buy, buys you what it did before and this happens in America, but many countries has this is expanded due to the lockdowns. And I wonder um, how do you think governments will go about attempting to quote unquote solve that problem? How do you think that looks? Yeah, Jake, I think that's a really good question. I think the first uh, thing that I must say is I don't think governments solve anything. Uh, <laughs> it felt weird to say that, right? I was like, well, how do you think they'll solve? That's why I put it in quotes. <laughs> Yeah, because look, the, the governments are not built, designed, or um, uh, they don't have the ability to solve these issues. Otherwise, they would or, have already solved them, or we would see um, uh, a pro progression instead of regression. Yeah, wealth gap in America is is, is uh, widening, um, especially since the '80s. So I think that it's a 30-year problem. I don't think that there's a uh, like a magic solution at all. Um, and so they're at a point now where they're saying, okay, well, is, is there a way to create something that's sustainable out of this? And, you know, what's coming out of the public and politicians, et cetera, is that, hey, we're, we're, we're giving so much money in Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. We're targeting the baby boomers. All of our federal aid is going to 65 and up. 
Maybe that's not the way to do it. We have now 75 million millennials, which is exactly the same number as baby boomers. And they're the taxpayers. They have uh, a lot of you know, single family uh, moms and dads. They have many people living at home. Maybe some of the federal aid should be directed at them. And now you come up with all this with this idea of child tax credits and child care, um, you know, uh, uh, UBI type uh, uh, programs without calling them UBI, which is just trying to give people money routinely so they can um, put them in their budgets and start living a life where they have an extra three hundred dollars in their pocket every month. The problem is, or four hundred or a thousand, whatever. The, the, that's not the problem. The problem is the government goes into super debt into to do this, and so it's all built on this uh, premise that hey, we can continue to do this, and we can continue paying very low interest rates for doing this. So I think the the whole situation is is on shaky grounds, um, but there is no good solution. Um, the there are many issues in America. Uh, one, and being the most important, is education. When uh, you know a lot of these people, they can never get into uh, high tech jobs or high paying jobs. If you look at, if you research the highest paying you know salaries in America, it's mostly uh, you know doctors and professions that have to do with with uh, the medical profession or tech, etc. You know, if you're if you're a person that doesn't have any savings. How can you even become a doctor realistically? It's, it's not even possible to do that. And I'm talking uh, about millions and millions of people, and that is a domestic economy issue. You, you don't uh, bring doctors from outside the United States. You need local people. So I think that the, that is the problem where you have what, exactly what Ray Dalio describes. You have two economies inside the United States, one for the, you know, for the top 30% and one for the rest of the 70, 80%. And, and these people on the top 20%, they, they live in, in their own planet. They, they, don't even, they don't understand what you're saying, Jake. They, they have no idea. What, they've never felt poverty. They've never felt scarcity. They, they've never seen a situation where there's no savings, where you have to, these people, they worry about meals and you know the kids being hungry. And getting evicted and not being able to pay better. It's, it's two different planets within the same United States. And I think that is, um, at this point, not solvable. Definitely not by taxing the rich. That, that's mathematically impossible. Uh, you, you will do not create enough uh, wealth or whatever, even if you tax 100%. And you have to consider being competitive. Um, you can't raise corporate taxes to 28 when the rest of the world is at 24 or 25 on average. It's, you don't live in a vacuum. And so no country has ever taxed itself in, into prosperity. That's uh, literally impossible. You know what I mean? That's, sort of, that's like trying to, uh, to fill a bucket and drink from it at the same, at the same time. It doesn't work. Um, so I think the United States needs a whole different solution. Most likely, it will not come from government. It will come from the private sector. The problem is that what the government did, in my opinion, that's just my opinion. The government did not um, punish or incentivize corporations uh, back in the 80s and 90s and the 2000s when they were offshoring everything. When you offshore... Uh, uh, 60 or 70 percent of your personnel, there needs to be repercussions. Now, I, I totally understand that it creates profitability for shareholders, etc. But there had to be some sort of a incentive or regulation or some sort of mechanism where all of these displaced workers in their 40s and 50s get retrained and put into a different industry that is staying local. You can't just take these people and and as a country, you can't uh, do that. Now, if, if the United States government is part of corporate America, I understand that, but they're not. They're part of the whole fabric of society, like you said, and they can't just desert people. So there needed to be some regulations in place where you, will, you fund 
uh, retraining for your programs for your employees that you're sacking because you're moving it to a third world country where you can get it for 90% off, which I get. I understand the competitive nature of it and everything like that. It's, it's understood, but there had to be repercussions. And that's what I think is lacking. Uh, in America, you now have automation, robotics, AI, 3D, all of this creating a situation where a lot of employees are not needed anymore. Like I said, 48 countries are even cheaper than China today to manufacture it. It's not like the United States is going to become a manufacturing hub again. They need to solve these issues, and you solve these issues by creating a blend between the right government incentives um, and the right ideas for corporate America. And that's why you need people that understand business at the same time as governance. The, the radical left only understand governance. They're like, okay, let's just tax these people. Let's just you know, take money from them and give to them. That's never gonna work. The other side, the pure capitalists, well, they created this issue where you chase profits and you have no repercussions for uh, society. So you have, you have so many homeless people and you have people that, that are 30 years, 40 years behind in their mindset. You need the blend, you need the, the mix of it. Um, and that's what I think is important. Uh, it has nothing to do with taxes, in my opinion. It has uh, everything to do with the free enterprise system um, incentivized in the right way. That's uh, how I would put it. So uh, fantastic. Last question is, if you were starting over looking at the world today and you were looking to create financial freedom for yourself, what do you do? If I'm in America right now and I need to start over, I am getting into real estate. Um, in, in the United States right now, about 33% of the workforce is millennials. By 2030, it will be 75%. Uh, millennials are gonna be the richest, most wealthy generation in history. And they're going to inherit amazing jobs from the boomers. They're going to inherit uh, real inheritance from their boomer parents. They mostly live unless there's a hundred percent inheritance tax <laughs> <laughs> or something crazy. But yeah, look, uh, they they they're a very big part of the economy right now. Uh, but like I said, there are only fifty out of the one hundred and fifty-six million employees that are out there. By the time this decade is over, they're going to be a hundred. In 20 of the 150, 160 million employees, they're going to create all the wealth. They're going to pay most of the taxes and they live at home. They live at home right now. I can tell you from the ground, because I am investing in real estate uh, funds that are uh, private fund, uh, private funds, there's a mad dash to build new homes, to, to, to buy land, all sorts of things. If you have no money, no money right now, or very, very little money, I would get immediately into real estate. You can find homes for people who do have money and earn sweat equity. Uh, that's very common in every uh, local uh, you know, hub that you're in, in your backyard, in your city. Go to the real estate clubs. You'll meet people with cash. They're the flippers. They buy, they rehab, they sell, but they can't go around looking for homes. They're looking for deals. You can look for deals for them and earn sweat equity. Um, there are many, people's, uh, many people that have started this way. Uh, connect with people that have the money and they're in real estate and they're doing flips or they're landlords and they're looking for their next home and find homes for them. If you have no money, that is one of the first things I would do right now. Secondly, I would find another person like Jake Ducey, another person that's young, that's hungry, that's looking to become an entrepreneur, and I would partner with him. I would ask him, what are you doing right now? How can I help you with your business? How can I scale your business? What is the next step for you? And I would partner with these people. I think partnerships are the most important thing in business, bar none. If you can connect with another person as passionate as you are, with other skills, it doesn't matter, other, other skill set, and you can get along. The chemistry is there. The harmony is there. I think that you can do amazing things, no matter if you have a high school education or a college education. Look, I went to high school. I, I was done with education there. Uh, I didn't go to college. I, I, I'm self-taught. 
as they, you know, as they say today. But look, I don't think college is, is the barrier for many of the things that you can do uh, in today's world. So I think that is uh, uh, the most important thing. Uh, another idea that, uh, that you might look into is anything that has a low startup cost and you can do from home. I think those businesses are really attractive for Americans because online businesses reach people that are not in just your community. They're not small businesses at all. They're global businesses. The second you open your website, you have a global business. So you need to really think about that. The third thing is I would become an expert. Don't dabble in something for a few months and then jump around. Find a niche where you really think that, that your natural abilities or your current abilities are really suited for this type of uh, business environment and stick with it. Um, there, there was a study that said that if you put a thousand hours into anything, you can become a world-class uh, master of it. They did the study with pianists. They gave people that have never played a piano a thousand hours and on a piano and they saw that they reached uh, the same level as the greatest of the greatest. So in other words, what I'm saying is if somebody has like 25,000 hours and 1,000 hours, they're almost at the same, they're, they're in, the, the, the changes are incremental. And you can look at like the 100 meter dash, right? How much did, uh, you know, did it, did it, it goes from like 9.86 in like 2006 to 9.58 today. It's, it's a few milliseconds. And these are people that trained the whole lives for this. So what I'm trying to tell you is don't think that Jeff Bezos has all of the answers. You can never compete with him. Put in a thousand hours in whatever you're trying to do, and you will reach a level where you're very competitive no matter who is in your city. So those three things uh, would be the things that I would uh, be looking into. That was amazing. Amazing way to end. It reminds me of a quote Tony Robbins always said. He'd say, it's not about your resources. It's about your resourcefulness. And yeah. what you shared was some fantastic ways to, to practice resourcefulness right now and, and seize opportunities. So I want to thank you for coming on today. For everyone listening, if you enjoyed this episode for the YouTube algorithm, make sure you hit that like button on this video. Give us a comment down below. Let us know that you enjoyed it to help send this video out into the YouTube universe more people see it make sure you hit that subscribe button that bell notification all that good stuff to get notified for future videos youtube's always changing their algorithm so make sure you hit that to stay notified leor where can uh, people find you uh wealthresearchgroup.com and um jake if i if i may say there's a there's a uh, a top menu tab called watch list many people have added, like you know they email or they click what what do you do with your own portfolio that button that's called watch list on our website that's that's my portfolio right there you can download the whole thing it's in, in a few different reports these are the companies that i'm personally invested in it even gives you the limit prices that i like to you know uh, get into these uh companies so uh something very transparent and um could be valuable to to your listeners and viewers so thank you everyone for listening we'll see you on the next episode and we'll uh talk to you soon